know that you primarily focus on open AI in this new book, and you discuss how, this is fascinating to me, how, what about China argument that is playing out in the West? Mm -hmm. That is actually justifying all these AI-related developments that are virtually unchecked, and that is actually leading to potential compromise of democratic values of AI. It's a, it's a big idea, but just walk us through it. Absolutely. I mean, Silicon Valley has long used this idea of what about China when they need to go in front of Congress, the U.S. Congress, and try and ward off regulation, ward off scrutiny. And the argument is always you shouldn't be regulating us because China is not going to regulate their companies and then we will not be able to compete in the global race for AI except for the small detail that China actually already has regulated many of these companies and is actually quite advanced in some AI regulations. And so what I argue in the book is that this is really just rhetoric from the American companies. It is a game that they play. They have played it very, very well. But the U.S. government needs to stop falling for that trap because otherwise these companies are going to develop this technology completely unfettered and start eroding away the rights of people around the world. So what is the right approach to AI development in the U.S. and in the Western world? What are some of the elements of perhaps a Chinese AI regulation that they can actually adopt as well? One of the things that I'm quite concerned about with Silicon Valley's current approach is very much that they are taking this scale at all costs approach where they are pumping extraordinary amounts of data, extraordinary amounts of compute into certain types of models with a nebulous idea of what these models will ultimately be for. And before we entered this particular paradigm, there was much more uh, development on AI using small amounts of data, small amounts of compute. And ironically, because the U.S. government in the last few years has really tried to constrain China's access to cutting edge AI chips, the Chinese companies have now taken a lead in trying to do this more compute efficient, data efficient development, such as with the Chinese company DeepSeek. And so I think that is a really key reminder when DeepSeek came out for U.S. companies to stop just scaling at all costs and actually start innovating mm -hmm. more on more sustainable more energy efficient methods. Mm, and I believe that you also reference in your book China's construction of data centers. And there is a bit of a mismatch problem at the moment in China in that area. So I think in general, there's a mismatch globally right now with data centers in that there is so mm. much capital being pumped into the rapid global expansion of data centers all around the world, the U.S. and China and the global south. And there isn't actually that much of a demonstration right now that we need that capacity. But the problem is once these bricks are laid, once the data centers are built, it's really hard to unwind. Mm. And they come with a lot of environmental costs costs, energy costs, water costs. And so I really try to caution in my book whether or not we really want to put pedal to the metal and move forward in this way. You say in the book that ChatGPT um, was a success beyond OpenAI's wildest dreams, Karen. So I guess there's a lack of well, there was an element of unpreparedness for just how absolutely seismic and, and, and world-changing this particular technology has been. The fact that there was that lack of preparedness, how did that shape what was to ensue at OpenAI and how the development of the technology itself has developed? Yeah, the reason why it was such a surprise to OpenAI was because they had already had certain technical capabilities within the company that they had uh, released to developers through methods that were much more difficult for the general public to access, but companies, the company representatives didn't actually realize um, once they made it more publicly accessible, more free, that it would be such a dramatic difference. And when the chatbot released and suddenly 
um, started, you know, crashing company servers, it created an enormous amount of pressure and frankly, enormous amount of chaos at the company because they didn't have enough staff on hand. They didn't have a robust infrastructure. They hadn't even figured out what kinds of rules they wanted to implement for a user product. Um, what would they allow users to do or not do? They were in the middle of writing it when ChatGPT was released. Um, and so in the time since, the company has really scrambled to kind of shore up all of these gaps within its governance, within its product development. But because there are so many other companies now rushing into the space globally to try and recreate their own chat GPTs, they're trying to do all of this shoring up while also racing and accelerating and trying to maintain number one. And so a lot of this development of this technology has become quite shaky in this aggressive race to be number one. Mm.